All right. So this afternoon, Ed and Loic have agreed to enlighten us about a subject, and they told me what it was, and I forgot. So <laughs> I'm going to let the two of them take over. Let me uh, allow them, oops, let me allow them to share their screen. One or one at a time, please. And uh, as a reminder, I will mute everybody. And uh, Ed and Loic, you'll have to unmute yourselves in order to talk. Here we go. Muting. Okay, Ed and Loic. Loic, I see you've unmuted already. Yeah, but I think we're going to leave Ed, you know, start today. And then I will take over in uh, 30 minutes or 40 minutes with a... Uh, a complementary topic. Uh, we kind of worked on this one together and then we were looking at, hey, let's have like two short presentations, a little bit of variety, uh, but somewhat, you, you see somewhat related as well. So, Ed. Okay, uh, I'm switching to presentation mode now. Okay, everybody got that? Yeah. Okay, well, today I'm I'm going to do a, an unusual presentation along, uh, well, uh, in philately and international mail order fraud, a variety of French connections. And uh, I called in for some help on this one. And uh, so uh, Loic, Loic has, has joined me in, in developing the, the material and the, and the presentation, and we'll see how all of this works out. Of course, these days in, in my life, everything starts with uh, philately and international mail order for fraud. And this is, uh, of course, Professor Segno's main area. And for those of you who haven't heard anything about Professor Segno, a very brief one slide introduction. He began an international mail order fraud scam from his Los Angeles office in 1900. And for about $10 a year, which was about $200 in today's purchasing power, what can join his success club and receive success waves twice a day. Uh, clients' lives would improve in all the areas noted in the success wave above. I won't read them right now because I'm going to read them later. By 1903, he had 12,000 members internationally of his success club. And a claim that he had 70,000 members in 1911 has also been recorded, but I don't consider that verified. So this, this presentation has its basis in this cover, okay? It's a cover that I purchased from eBay about two months ago uh, and began to wonder, is this an unusual signal cover with many French connections? It was received in the village of Preti in France on April 23rd, 1912. That's an auspicious day in my book because that's my birthday. Uh, it was readdressed from Preti three days later uh, to one Madame A. Louise Evans back at, at its starting point, uh, Inspiration Point in Los Angeles. It has a seeming outbound rate of one cent uh, to France and an inbound rate of 40 centimes. And both are unusual rates, as in 1912, when this was sent, the US France rate was five cents and the French US rate was 25 centimes. Uh, you can see the pretty uh, uh, backstamp when this arrived, which gives the date. I should have mentioned that. Uh, somehow I had the feeling that this this uh, cover was going to bring me to a lot of different places. Uh, so early in the game, I spoke to Loic about it. We had been conversing, of course, all along about group type items. And I asked if, if he might uh, join me in trying to unravel this cover uh, in all of its and, and related aspects. So Loic joined me. And here's the cover close up. And uh, uh, as, as you can see, it, 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 it has that one cent stamp on it. It doesn't seem to have any other US stamps. Uh, then it's got some French stamps over the cancellation. It began an inspiration point. It, ha it has two addresses, one that is crossed out uh, and another written in. 
Uh, and it, it just seems like a, a very unusual cover. Also has a little hole in it right here, and uh, that'll that'll come up a li a li in a little bit. So in, in starting to sort out this cover, the first question was uh, uh, leaving the United States it left from Inspiration Point. And the question is, when and where uh, is Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California? That turned out to be a, a pretty easy question to answer because in my signal collection, I have this dupl duplex postcard, which is actually posted from Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California, the, the, the very same uh, uh, address uh, as, uh, uh, as shown previously. Uh, you know, this, this printed matter piece uh, was, was uh, mailed from Los Angeles by the date stamp at a rate of one cent per two ounces. That's a third class printed matter rate uh, for the U.S., you also note there's no there's no date in the date stamp and and this is typical uh for printed matter in in the US. The second half of the postcard is uh, or not half but the other side here is the business end and you see the Syracuse arrival which is nice it's July 20th 1908 so that gives us a sense of period for the departure in in early July and then the important advertisement uh just a little little vignette and it says, if you seek success, write to the Segno Success Club. Very, very simple ad. Then when you turn this over and at the lower right, uh, you, you see pictures of two of Segno's buildings. And it notes the main one there is the American Institute of Mentalism, home of the Segno Success Club at Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California. So that pretty, pretty much uh, closes where where inspiration point is. If you look at the other post, uh, the other photograph, uh, that's once you go in the main entrance. Uh, let me see if my yeah it shows up. Uh, you go up the main entrance into the reception area and through, and you come out into the courtyard and gardens, which is what Segno called inspiration point. And there's this is his inspiration point. This is Echo Lake, which today is Echo Lake Park. Uh, one of the famous parks in, in Los Angeles. So uh, it seems that the outgoing rate is the same one penny printed matter rate per two ounces uh, that the duplex postcard was. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's just no other American U.S. US frankings on this. Uh, I took the I took the cover and, and backlighted it to see if I could bring out the cancellation uh, on the one cent U.S. U.S. stamp, and you can see it below here. It's Los Angeles, California, 1912. Nothing in the center quite similar to this. And then we have wavy lines here. We have a two and a C. We have a two and a C. And this is pretty much the same, or an identical, or the identical printed matter postmark, postmark used on the duplex postcard. Uh, so this 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 is a a one sun team printed matter rate uh, going out from Los Angeles and the it, in you know the the realistic explanation is the envelope was a standard outgoing information pa information package from the American Institute of Mentalism and the Segno Success Club at that one printed matter rate the probable contents and I'm just taking a guess at this uh, but it's it's based on all I've learned in this area. Uh, it contained a printed letter of an introduction. It can, contained an application bank blank for membership in the Success Club. It contained an order form for books that were being sold by Segno. And importantly, it contained a pre-addressed returned envelope. These were either printed or typed for mailing back to Los Angeles uh, from whoever the addressee was. And here's a typical example that doesn't have all the complexity of what I showed you. Uh, the, the North Belmont Avenue is, is Segno's actual uh, street number uh, address. And you can see this has been that sent at the one sun, one penny rate. I keep, I'm going to keep saying some teams here uh, at the one penny rate from Los Angeles from Station E. And that was the post office nearest Segno's operation. And the thing to note is Segno sent out thousands of these informal informational envelopes every week to potential clients 
But as printed matter, very, very few have survived and they're, and they're quite rare. And here's a typical uh, uh, advertising information uh, uh, sheet that Segno enclosed with, uh, with his uh, outbound printed matter envelopes. You can see on the left, absolutely free to you, health or success, him sending the sex success wave, and he's offering a month's treatment free of charge here. And what's it all about? Of course, the, the section in the center here describes everything you want to know about the wonderful power of mentalism. And at the right, you have an order form, but, but before you get to the free treatment, it's really an order form for his book, The Law of Mentalism, for $3. Uh, and then you get free treatment for whatever you can come up that ails you with relation to uh, these issues here, here at the left. And at the bottom here, you have, of course, testimonials all the time from, from clients who've been exceptionally pleased by, uh, uh, by Segno and, uh, uh, and his operations. Uh, here, here are two copies of the law of mentalism. Uh, uh, I just uh, want to use this to point out that Segno operated in all the major European languages. You see the German edition of the, the Law of Mentalism at the left that was published by the Segno Success Club Berlin Division. That's another story. And at the right, uh, you see one in French, uh, again, a French connection uh, that shows the Law of Mentalism, but it's a French edition printed in 1950, 10 years after Segno's death with a new editor, uh, uh, an introduction by Paul Clément Jago. Uh, I have no idea who he was at this point, but Segno's influence was still around in France in 1950, as I said, 10 years after he died. So he, he created a little stir in his lifetime. And here's a, a typical return envelope, pre-addressed return envelope. This one was pre-addressed to Annie Del Segno, his former wife, who he divorced in 1911, but was treasurer of the American Institute of Mentalism uh, throughout uh, uh, the period. Uh, and this one comes from the small village of Argensis in, in Calvados. Uh, uh, I, uh, I think somebody uh, uh, just mentioned, mentioned Calvados, and this is properly franked at the 50 centime rate uh, with a, a nice group of uh, sewer stamps. And uh, since it's registered, it probably contains some monetary vehicle for the purchase of membership in the Success Club or maybe a book, who knows, at, at this point. And uh, I show you a picture of this village to remind me to tell you and to tell you that when I started this, this collection, I, I thought that I was going to mostly be collecting covers from the major cities, the capitals of countries, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out in reality, uh, I'm collecting a lot of material from the small villages. And I think Argensis is, is one of those small villages or was one of those small villages back in, back in time. So we've pretty much established this, this cover as a, as a printed matter piece going out from the Segno operations. Uh, 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 in Echo, uh, in, at Echo Lake, Echo Park, uh, in Los Angeles. And we can ask the next question, and who was the addressee? And what can we learn about her? And the addressee is, is written in manuscript with black ink and then crossed out. It's been crossed out. You can see it crossed out. And, uh, when you look at this carefully with a little backlighting, you can see it was addressed to Mademoiselle Lucie Gautier at the Chateau des Pendants, uh, in the area of Tournau and the Saône, Saône and Loire, uh, Department of France. Uh, added to it is, is the village of Prati, Prati in manuscript, most probably by a pro post office clerk. Uh, uh, this is a commune in Eastern France in Dijon and Lyon, which, which relates to the addressee. So, so we have an idea who the addressee is. Uh, there's that back stamp again, just to show you it did, it did make it through the mails. And, uh, uh, Loic went and, and, uh, started looking for the Chateau des Pendant and came up, uh, uh, with a, actually there are a couple of these postcards. Uh, this one happens to be, uh, uh, used, mailed within the, the same department. 
uh, that the chateau is in. And you notice at the top, it says, in the environment of Tornu, Preti, Chateau Pendant, 19th century. And the, propri the, the property owner, it's the property of Madame Gautier, the very person who was the, the addressee on the, uh, on the letter. And you look at this, of course, it's not a chateau in, in the sense of Chambord or Chenonceau. It's more like a manor house, okay? And, and you've got two floors uh, where, where the owners lived, an upper floor where probably the service staff lived, an outer building for horses, some gardens, a nice approach thing. It's a nice, a nice country home. And, and this is the Chateau uh, de Pendant where, where Lucy Gautier left, uh, lived. Uh, so what about her? Okay. What, what information have we been able to find out about her? Well, she was born in 1892 and died in 1917 at only 34 years of age. And she was the daughter of Simone Gautier, a winemaker at the Chateau Alox Corton in Burgundy, and one Marie Adele Vaffier. Well, I, I stopped right there and, and uh, wanted more information on the Chateau. And it turns out today, uh, you see the, the label of the Chateau for its wines at the lower left, and, and it's, it's got all the right things written. You know, it's a premier clue, a premier crew. It's got the, the area uh, where it was produced, the specific domain. Uh, this stuff goes for 50 to 60 bucks a bottle. It's a very fine French Pinot Noir. So, so Lucy's father had a, had a pretty good, pretty good job. And at the right is a picture of that chateau. And you can see it's built in the beautiful, uh, Burgundy style or bone style. I, I seen a famous building, the Hospice de Bone and, and Bone, uh, that looks very, very much, uh, uh, like this. So back to Lucy, uh, we, we learned in 1912, she had published two novels, one entitled Unnecessary Will, and a second one called Fate Leads Us. And she became a member of the Academy de Macon. Uh, and uh, that, that is a society dedicated to arts, science, and literature. And this next, next sentence is, is one of Loic's, but it was so on, tar uh, on target that I just had to, uh, had to quote it. And, and, and Loic, Loic wrote, it's quite possible that the pseudo-scientific approach of Signal's American Institute of Mentalism found in Lucie Gautier a somewhat receptive spirit. And I think that's right on target. You, you, you look at those, the titles of her novels. You know, it's not murder on the Orient Express or something like that. These are, these are very philosophical, uh, uh, things that you, that you, that you think about and, and, and wonder about. If, if you look at Segno's publications, of course, you have the law of mentalism into this world and why that, boy, that sounds like something Lucy might like, uh, how to Live a Hundred Years, Force Invisible or the Psychic Thief, or Personal Magnetism, the, speak the Secret of Memory. Yeah, she might have, she might have liked these books uh, that might have caught her attention. If you, if you go to the web, you can actually find her books uh, still being offered for sale. The one at the left is available from A Books. And the one at the right is, is as you can see, from uh, off, offered on Dell Camp right now. It's interesting to note that's the the third edition of of that book, uh, which which uh, indicates something quite important. And something else you can find on the web is the uh, a book plate from Lucy Gautier, which which is which is quite interesting. And I was so enthusiastic about this that I decided to buy it, and it's on the way. Uh, so I can't show you the re the original. Uh, then Loic came up with this portrait of uh, Lucy Gautier. Uh, wow, uh, this is this is really quite impressive. It was painted in Cannes in 1904 by Princess Sanina Gagarin Strutza, a Russian painter. And and you 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 look at Lucy, and you know she's really got a very very fine dress on. Uh, but there's a certain sadness about, about her look, uh, philosophical kind of, kind of a, a, a bit of sadness. And, and in a way, she dissolves a bit into the background, uh, uh, 
in the in the uh, picture. So I think we can conclude Lucy was not a party girl. Okay, I, I think she was a very very serious person. Uh, this picture was actually sold at the Hotel Drouot, and and uh, Loic is now on the job of trying to find out how much it sold for, and can we find out anything else about it to to add to the story? We uh, see the, the the company that sold it. I mean, the, the auction house actually went into bankruptcy a few years ago. So I, I haven't got any response from there. Uh, well, from it the just makes the task there. more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> the Success Club has not worked with them. Uh, we'll have to send out some good waves. <laughs> yeah. So uh, here's here's an obituary for Lucy uh, from the uh, Annals of the Academy de Mekon. Uh, she was she was born in in Cru, Cruzeri on uh, in 1882, died in 1917. Fortunately endowed with a rare intelligence, the greatest of her pleasures was to indulge in, a lit in literary works and write what her talent for observation and brilliant imagination inspired her. It is to this reason that we owe the pleasure of having been able to read her two novels which have the titles which I previously mentioned. Highly appreciated, these two books have been a legitimate success, especially the second, which is in its third edition. She left manuscripts of several plays and an important work entitled Vers le Calm, uh, Towards Calm, uh, again, another kind of philosophical title, whose main action takes place in the city of Macon. The war did not allow her to publish it, but we hope that it will one day be the case and that we'll have the opportunity to read it with the same pleasure as the previous ones. Our society was honored to have Miss Gautier as a full member, and ultimately her death brought us the deepest regret. Kind of a, a sad thing. So why did she reuse this envelope? In fact, we can never know for sure, but we can take guesses. Possibly she had already used the pre-addressed return envelope to initiate some business with the su success club. Possibly membership, that's a logical thing. And then she decided that the signal ideas were of such great interest to her that she wanted to order a copy of the Law of Mentalism, of course, in French. So she readdressed the incoming envelope, added an order form uh, or letter noting her interest, placed 15 francs in cash, about $3 at a time, in the envelope with some cardboard sheets, uh, and then she realized, or the post office told her, she had reached the second weight level and required 40 some teams of stamps to prepay the postage. Well, this all assumes, of course, she had used the pre-addressed uh, envelope, and I'm, I'm searching Decamp and eBay every week to see if I can find a letter from her, from Pretty, uh, that was sent to the Signal organization. Uh, in the same way the one we're talking about now uh, was sent to the Signal organization. So uh, what about uh, what about the inbound journey to Los Angeles now? The address of, of Lucy Gautier was crossed out in black. The letter was readdressed in violet. It was franked at 40 centimes. That's double weight. That's a double weight letter, 15 to 30 grams, posted from Preti, on April 26, 1912, three days after arrival. So this was a fairly rushed thing. And it's definitely sent back to the Signal organization, one Madame A. Louise Evans, Inspiration Point, Echo Park, Los Angeles, California, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, I mentioned the whole, and if you look at a, a number of the Signal letters in my collection, like this just simple 25 centime non-registered letter, uh, you notice some mess here, and if you backlight it, they're actually pinholes, okay? And uh, often the signal organization would pin together the contents inside the envelope with the envelope so as not to lose information. And I think that's what happened here. Uh, it, the, it was pinned to the contents of this envelope going back to L.A., but then was torn away uh, rather than the pins pins removed. Just an observation. So the question is, who was A. Louise Evans? Well, fortunately for the group type, uh, I, I started developing a database, a DOS-based level database in 1985. And I just carried that database over to my fraud collection. So I did a search 
and my fraud collection for uh, uh, Evans, basically. And you can see here's a lot of the data that I record in, in, in my uh, uh, database, which makes it easy to find things. And I do have the address uh, 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 on the letter. And you see, it actually comes out in this case, Senor Louis, Louis Evans, but it's uh, A. Louise Evans. Uh, that's, that's just a minor transcription. And there, there's a second page, which I won't dwell on with more information. And here's, here's the letter from Argentina to Louise Evans. Okay, you can see it's registered from Buenos Aires. I have another one registered from a small town in Mexico where someone has written in a Louisa Evans. Very nice French military franchise letter uh, from a military post office 168 with a control, uh, military uh, control hand stamp on it. Uh, we have the uh, information on the sender. And obviously the franchise was not, not available for overseas letters. So it picked up a 25 Sun Team stamp and, and root. And you see it's to Louise Evans at the Institute of Mentalism. Another one from Paris, uh, uh, Louise Evans, secretary of the Success Club, uh, 50 Sun Team registered rate. And, and the last one is actually from Monte Carlo, from Monaco at a 10 Sun Team postcard rate uh, uh, to Senora A. Louise Evan, little perturbations there, with a message in, in Italian. So if we put all of this together, out of a collection of 280 covers, five are addressed to Evans, one from Argentina where the language is Spanish, one from Mexico where the language is Spanish, two from France where the language is French, uh, one from Monaco written in Italian. All of the addresses associated with A. Louise Evans are associated with the American Institute of Mentalism, the Segno Success Club, and the fact that she was a secretary there during the 1910-16 period. However, the language evidence suggests she was also fluent in the Romance languages and probably handled the desk for clients who spoke and wrote in these languages. And uh, we know as a fact that the fraudsters functioned in all of the major European languages and maintain, maintain personnel with specific language talents to properly handle their foreign customers. So this brings me back to the Monaco postcard now, which was posted from Monaco on July 28th, 1910 in Monte Carlo uh, on the train that ran from Ventimiglia, Italy to Nice, France. That's a coastal train. It has a French style TPO cancel, uh, Ventimiglia a Nice, uh, uh, the wavy line cancel, which in, in uh, the, the French call the convoyeur cancellations. Uh, the British, and, and uh, uh, we have McBister on board today, the British call them the Wigglies. Uh, that's their name for these cancellations. And it also has a Segno arrival uh, uh, hand stamp from August 12th, 1910. We look a little closer, we can, we can see the convoy air cancel quite clearly. Uh, the year's not there, but it is written at the left in, in manuscript. Uh, you see the address to, to Evans. Interestingly, this received hand stamp from Segno is from the treasury of the organization. And it's, they accepted bills, they accepted coins, they accepted checks, they accepted drafts, they accepted money orders, they accepted express orders, and they accepted foreign currency. They also accepted postage. So you could pay for your Segno wares by almost any way. And I really appreciate that because I went through a period in my life where it was very, very difficult paying for French lots. This is pre, pre, del, uh, pre, uh, PayPal, uh, uh, when we used to have to pay our, our overseas bills with great, great difficulty. The Monaco postcard was written in Italian, a Romance language, and signed by Mantovani Santina and her sisters Pascalina and Glorietta. It is sent, uh, the sender is Santina Mantovani, who was born in 1896 in Monaco. Her parents were Antoine Mantovani, a local public works contractor, uh, and Marie Dalmaso, uh, her, uh, her mother. Her sisters Pascalina and Glorietta were born in 1898 and 1901, also at Monaco. And the question is, how did the Mantovani sisters get to know about the Success Club? Well, we don't know. 
But we know that Santino, who wrote the postcard, was a few months shy of her 14th birthday when she mailed it to Evans. And she ends the, the postcard with many beautiful thoughts and thanks for your support and friendship, which indicates that the teenager had built a solid relationship with Evans. So was Santina just a friend or, or was she a client of the Success Club and a victim of the overall Segno scam? It's quite probable that Santina and maybe her family were clients of the Segno organization and quite pleased with the results they thought they had that they thought had been achieved with their membership in the Success Club. Uh, as Lloyd pointed out, they decided to communicate their happiness via a 10 cent tontine postcard rather than a reverse success wave, which is interesting. With his success waves and membership in the Success Club, Segno claimed that clients' lives would be improved in the areas of, again, success, influence, happiness, ambition, health, wealth, peace, hope, and love. There was a pretty high probability that someone would join the su success club and something good would happen in one of their one or more of these broad categories of, of their lives. And what people don't realize is just because we do A and B happens does not mean there is an association between the two. As a species, humans are easily fooled, be it in Segno's era or our own. And and I have a lot of a lot of people I could put in this line, uh, uh, who I could go after. I've chosen to go after Linus Pauling, who received two unshared Nobel prizes, chemistry and peace. Uh, he no Linus Pauling defined the nature of the chemical bond and chemical structure, and he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry for that. And then he became a strong advocate for peace during the atomic age and also received the Nobel Prize for that. But he also championed the use of vitamin C, uh, one gram a day in the treatment of colds, and also for the use of cancer. And these are treatments that never manifested themselves in human medicine. In fact, uh, uh, because of Pauling's influence, they did do double-blind placebo-controlled studies on colds with one gram of vitamin C over a one-week period and showed no association be between curing of colds and, and uh, vitamin C. But Pauling had already established an institute and, and was madly pursuing uh, vitamin C and cancer and, and, and colds. Uh, once he got this data, he upped the treatment to 10 grams a day, uh, which kind of showed he, he was really just flailing around and didn't know what he was doing. So even Linus Pauling could be fooled. Back to Professor Segno, of course, with the international males, he always had endless clientele to appeal to, even if current clients realized his scheme was a total fraud. Uh, uh, you know, he, he required tens of thousands of, of, of people for a success club to be a success to him, whereas the international males gave him access to uh, tens of millions of people at, at, at least. So such is the story of uh, Lucy, Lucy and Santina, who most probably were members of the Segno Success Club. This is the first time anyone has had a chance to meet people who were taken in by the Segno scam. Both were highly intelligent, well-educated, and of reasonable means. And A. Louise Evans seems to have been more than a simple secretary in the Se in Segno's operations. She was skilled in major European languages and was a key contact for many of Segno's foreign clients. I do wonder, did she know successful Segno's success waves were pure bull, or did she believe in them? And just to include another French connection, uh, there's that little vignette of Professor Segno. I recently got a copy uh, all in French, and, and I'm hoping I can find one on, a, on an envelope uh, just to add to, uh, to the collection. So that's my story. Uh, v, oh, yeah. But I, I have to thank Loic for uh, helping me get much of this information with his, his exceptional talents and, and insight. We first met, of course, with uh, a mutual interest in the group type, but but... It was while working on this uh, 
I, I got the feeling of, of a new strong French connection. And I couldn't help but think of the closing line of Casablanca when Humphrey Bogart and Claude Lorraine's walk into the distance going off to Brazzaville to join the Free French with Charles de Gaulle. And Bogart says, and I paraphrase, Look, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Uh, I I was going to end there, but I, I was looking at this picture of me, and all of a sudden, you know, when I got this is a 2006 portrait of me or photo of me that I turned into a portrait, uh, and when I got it, it didn't have these dots, and you know, the, the physicist De Broglie uh, taught us that that waves can travel either as packets, as particles, or as waves. And it, it looks like I'm getting a few packets of, of, of something there. And I, I started thinking, this glitch of dots suddenly appeared on my JPEG. Is Professor Segno trying to contact me via brain waves from wherever his spirit resides in the multiverse? I don't know, but I call your attention to my, my tie which is derived from a photo of the birefringent pattern of paraminobenzoic acid when exposed to polarized light. Is this a perfect antenna for reception of success waves? And here's an actual photo, photograph of, of the birefringent pattern. I mean, it's really exciting and you can see it. It, it matches, matches my tie. And it doesn't end there. I was making up this slide on May 15th, drinking my, can I show you? Uh, let's see, can I, can I get it? Yeah, drinking my Snapple tea. Okay, and I happened to look down uh, at the Snapple cap uh, and saw something written in it. Real Fact 832, today brain waves can power an electric train. Wow. So my concluding thought is I think Professor Segno would be delighted and pleased what we what we can do with brainwaves today. So with that, I'll thank you for your uh, attention. Uh, I'll be happy to take any comments or answer any questions. Folks, remember to unmute, but speak right up. Yeah, that's going to be a tough act to follow, but I will do my best. And <laughs> thank you so much. It has been a very interesting, like, exchange over a few weeks of, of emails, you know, daily, if not, you know, quite a few daily. I love it. It's, uh, it's so much fun. Um, and, and I would say, you know, you never know when, when you start this kind of discussion with Ed, it might take you to some, like, really, really weird places, but it is such a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, we've had a lot of fun, and and you know, I, I I mean, I'm I'm learning I'm learning more from you about French wine right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's good. <laughs> oh, he's got some great stories. Oh, we're just beginning to get into them. Well, so, um. I don't know. Let me know if you guys, if there is more questions. Otherwise, I can start also uh, with my own my own material to complement what what Heather told you. And I mean, the way I will introduce this, if you if you're ready, is that we have seen that there were, you know, those waves from Professor Segno uh, traveling across the world, but other things have been uh, traveling across the world, and so that's what I'm going to share on my screen. And, I was going to say, Loic, if anybody has any questions at this point, they can use success waves and send them directly to Ed. <laughs> Probably true as well. <laughs> but so what, what I want, what I wanted to do here and, and try to also point out a couple of, of um, similarities between this topic and what Ed just presented is look at those like circumnavigation attempts. And I, of course, because I, you know, I'm a specialist or I'm a, a, a lover of the, of the group type. With pun intended, I titled it circumnavigation and commerce attempt because the group type is also known as navigation and commerce. Um, so you know, you know the, the 
around the world in 80 days from, from Jules Verne, you know, that was published in 1873. And so that book got a lot of people completely crazy about everything around going around the world. Okay. It, it became like a, like a, like a big thing. Um, of course, going around the world is nothing new. Uh, deep water navigation, you know, uh, Fernando de Magellan did that almost 500 years ago, a little bit more, you know, in, in, in 1519. Uh, and multiple countries had issued stamps to to commemorate that. You know, you had a a nice one from Monaco. You had a block here from from Liechtenstein with that same stamp from Monaco, and then you have a nice you know block from uh, from Uruguay. Um, so that's that was something quite quite interesting. And what I want to do here is look at first a general story of um, you know those attempts to have male travel around the world, and then focus on a couple of, of course, what else, you know, group type examples. Um, so let's let's get started. Um, and you will forgive me for some of the, some of the scans are not of a very, very good quality, but they're also, you know, gotten from, from prior auctions or, or, uh, or Del Camp and whatnot. But here we start with a, an 18, uh, 1879 postcard from Germany initially, you know, uh, out, of, uh, out of Hamburg, um, that was sent to the Council of the German Empire uh, in Bombay, I think, initial, initial uh, letter. Um, and you can also, San Francisco, I don't recall exactly where it went first, but um, pretty much it went from, from Hamburg to San Francisco, then it was forwarded to Yokohama in Japan, then it went to Bombay in India, uh, and finally it returned to Hamburg via Alexandria. You see the uh, post Egyptiani uh, Alexandria po uh, postmark here. Um, I haven't really taken a long, long look and detailed look at that postcard, but it's for me probably the earliest I have seen of uh, of mail having gone around the world. You know, just maybe what four or five years after the the Jules Verne's book was uh, was published, um, <clears throat> and I look at it as a pretty good example of German engineering. Uh, because it actually did travel around the world, um, not in 80 days, it took four months. Um, but that's, for me, quite, quite an, interesting, an interesting feast. Um, you can see all of yeah, all different cancels, uh, different stamps from, from India, uh, from, from the US here, from Germany. Um, what was missing, I didn't see any stamp from... From Japan, I think on this. I don't know why. Maybe it's on the back. I don't have. I don't have the back. Um, another, another attempt. So this one, I think, was successful. Here goes another attempt. A few years later, uh, this time from from Belgium. Uh, quite, uh, quite crude, in in my opinion. And I, when I read the postcard, I was not sure about the the chances of success, uh, giving that the sender um, Gustave. Uh, is basically asking his friend, you know, dear friend, please, you know, so be kind enough to send me as quickly as possible rare stamps and postcards for my collection. Please, you know, uh, answer me quickly, you know, your 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 friend, you know, Gustav. And, and when he sent the postcard, he put, you know, Mr. Krempo, I guess, you know, in 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 Rome. And then if he's not there, Yokohama, Japan, and if he's not there. Boma Congo, if it's not there, Nicaragua. <laughs> and finally, if it's still not there, send it back to Courtre to my address, you know, uh, to Rue de, de Mousseron. Um, that card actually never left Courtre. It was directly uh, marked uh, retour à Courtre, uh, non admis, not admitted by, by the postal service. It, it, it traveled for one day, you know, it was basically <laughs> sent the 2nd of September and it came back the 3rd. Uh, they didn't really accept it to, to, to you know, uh, run this, this postcard through the mail. Uh, and honestly, with that series of cities, you know, from Rome to Yokohama to, to Boma and Congo, Nicaragua, I think it would have been a series of zigzags, but not really a full around the world tour. Um, so probably not such a good idea. Uh, but that doesn't mean that people didn't stop trying. I didn't stop trying. And so here we have another one, this time uh, coming out of, uh, of London, I think. And it was a little bit more um, reasonable. It was mostly, let's try to get a mail that goes just across Europe. Uh, and that's what the, the sender explains here. 
Okay, this card is as a matter of bet intended to be mailed over Europe within 21 days. And that is to say in such an order as mentioned at foot. Um, all the parties to whom it has been directed will greatly oblige by cancelling the old address and putting the next one in place, um, at the same time stating day of arrival and remailing, blah, 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 blah. blah. Uh, any postage will be willingly repaid, and any of the parties desiring uh, it will receive a full photograph of the card after its return. Made travel safely and soon return. Uh, it left London. It went to its first recipient, I guess, in the, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, and there it was sent back to London, uh, where it was basically, uh, probably they tried, I don't know, there is no other addresses. It was just, you know, all was striped in red and London and the return. Uh, you have the, the Rebu, um, uh, you know, lost letter kind of, uh, kind of mark if you want here. And I deliver for the reason stated, I really cannot say what the reason was because um, <laughs> I can't read this, but... This one, same here, didn't really achieve its, its intended results. So all of those nice people here never received the mail, but you can see it was from expected to go from Holland to Germany to Russia to Malta to Portugal and then back to London. Um, so it went, it went back there directly. That is, that is quite sad. Um, I was still able to find quite a series of postcards, and apparently postcards were, were much more... Uh, used for this kind of thing. And the reason that was given is if you were to actually send letters with that were forwarded like this, most likely at some point in time, they would be lost because somebody would open them to see what was inside <laughs> and maybe steal it. But postcard, there was no such risk because there was nothing to, to remove from inside the postcard. Uh, and all of those here were actually sent by um, the 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 Mesperanto aficionado, you know, the people who spoke all of those different, uh, that, that new kind of made-up language. Um, and so that would have been actually quite simple from, uh, from Victor Signal. You know, if he had used Esperanto back then, it would have been able to communicate with everybody without having need for, for multiple languages. But um, what's interesting here, so all of this is written in Esperanto, and then there is a, a common person, uh, Carlos Charrier in, uh, in Montevideo in uh, uh, in Uruguay, that that comes quite frequently on those letters. He was probably uh, one of the main like uh, esperantisto um, in in at that time in that uh, in that part of the world. So a lot of mail traveled and, and and you know went to him before being sent back. But most of those actually have done almost a, a, a you know around the world kind of trip uh, with nice succession of uh, of stamps from from multiple countries. Sadly, not a single. Not a single group type. Uh, this is apparently those, those letters where or those postcards were, were quite challenging for the mail. Uh, writing them was a was a difficult matter. Uh, so in um, uh, 1925, something like that. I think the UPU decided that this was no longer to be accepted and was not a not not a right way to send to send mail and that they will no longer actually you know process that kind of that kind of mail because it was really really too much of a of a challenge for those people who work in the in the sorting uh, facilities for for the mail you know there was all of those addresses all of which you know struck out and say, and whatnot it was it was really hard to 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 process so but 25 years later we had the beginning of aerophilately and so, obviously, you know, a few companies uh, came up with the idea that, hey, why not send mail? We can no longer use the post to transport the mail, carry the mail for us and forward it. But if we carry the mail ourselves with our planes, we can have it stamped in different places and then have a nice philatelic souvenir. So which is what, what we have here. Um, you know, what I call some interesting commercial shenanigans. And I would not say this is mail order fraud because actually, but it's not exactly, well, it's, it's kind of mail, but it's a weird partnership between the postal service and and the airline. Okay, so here you have a, a little uh, aerogram that, that started in Paris and it sends to Natal in Brazil. Uh, and then you have from, from Natal, from Brazil, it is sent to New York. And you're going to tell me, well, that's not really a 
tour du monde, that's not around the world, I would say yes, but that's actually not everything there is to this little uh, little card because there is actually multiple folds. And so from New York, it was sent to Hong Kong. And then from Hong Kong, it was sent back to Paris. And so you have on four different pages and everything falls nicely, you have those stamps from France, from Brazil, from the US and from Hong Kong. Um, and interestingly, uh, I also found this kind of letter from the, um, you know, Direction Commerciale, the, 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 <laughs> the sales office from, from Air France in Paris, uh, dated uh, November 23rd, 1937, that explained, you know, to one of their customers, we have the pleasure to send you, you know, that tour du monde around the world kind of, you know, um, aerogram that you had subscribed from us in September. Uh, the trip went well, uh, as expected, uh, according to the following itinerary, you know, so Paris, uh, departure on the 16th of October, Toulouse, 17th of October, Natal in Brazil arrived on, on the 18th, uh, departure from Natal on the 22nd, New York, Hong Kong, Marseille, and Paris. Um, and so this was the kind of stuff that Air France would, would basically, you know, this, this philatelic souvenir that Air France would uh, would prepare and, and, and sell to some of their, I don't know if these people used to take, you know, might have taken some of the, the Air France flights, but definitely they would enjoy the mail that Air France was carrying in their planes. Um, and uh, they also, you know, to allow you to uh, start or, or enrich your collection, we also send you, you know, enclosed a list of aerograms that are very interesting, you know, that we have currently in stock. So you can buy more from us. Uh, like a little side, probably side business to make some money from, <laughs> from, from, from like, you know, interesting, interesting uh, philatelic souvenirs. Uh, I had no idea that Air France was in that kind of business, but actually I should have known because uh, still 50 years later, we were still, you know, doing this, this time with the Concorde, um, where there are multiple souvenirs. I actually found so many of those that had really no, no real clue about, about those kind of letters. Um, gave us like some, you know, very, very, I don't know, not, I don't know if I would say beautiful, but some, some quite, quite interesting, you know, collectible covers that didn't really travel to the mail because they were just carried by the Concorde from one stop to the next during one of those like special flights uh, where it was, you know, the flight was sold and, and the mail was carried as a world tour. Um, they give you all of the different stops and your stopover. So you start in Paris, then you go to Cairo, then you go to New Delhi, and then you go to Singapore, then you go to uh, Bali, and then Sydney in Australia, uh, Nandi in Fiji, oh. then you're in Honolulu in, in, in the US, then uh, Las Vegas in the US again, then you go to the Bahamas and you have a stand from Nassau before coming back to Paris. This was his first, his first letter. And there is quite a few more uh, with series of stamps and they were all the stamps were probably put on those letters at the local post office and then they will take them back to the Concorde and oh here we go <laughs> um so uh, and and to tell you it was actually at that time you know um I those flights lasted something like I don't know uh you know like two weeks, a little bit more, three weeks, you know, 20 February here to nine, nine of March. So yeah, about 10, 20 days or three weeks. So that was probably much better than the 80 days from Jules Verne. Uh, total flight time was even less than that. You know, um, the, the first round of world flight was done in, in only 31 hours, even if it took, or flight time, even if it took probably much more than that in terms of, you know, day to day. Um, and before we move to, to the group type, I have a bit of trivia for you. So in, in 1996, uh, the, the Concorde that had, you know, the, the code sign, you know, BTSD, um, and it is, we can find it like in quite a few of those letters. I don't know which, I don't recall which one, but um, there was one Concorde that was painted in a very weird blue livery. Any of you remember it? Any of you has an idea what it was? For my American friends, <laughs> nope. I mean, I was I, I was shocked as well when I saw it <laughs> because this is what what it looks like. <laughs> so the Concorde was painted by Pepsi 
or by Air France with, with a Pepsi color as part of a, of a big, big uh, global promotion uh, in which Pepsi invested at the time in 1996, something like uh, $500 million. Um, so it's quite, quite interesting. Um, I had totally missed that fact uh, that we had had a, a Concorde painted as a, as a color of Pepsi. Um, and so enough with all of these like, you know, fun facts and, 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 and made up letters. Let's now move into, uh, into group type, okay? We have to go back to the group type, otherwise I wouldn't be myself. Uh, and we're gonna look this time at a, a mixed ranking on mail uh, that travel not completely around the world, but it traveled from Bombay in, today in Mumbai in, uh, in India to Mexico City. Uh, and actually that journey took 18 months and I will explain why as we go, as we go through. So this is what the cover looks like. Uh, you can see on it, uh, it has a group stamp. So that explains why uh, I care about it. It has some stamp from India, uh, from the US, from Japan. Um, it was sent as a printed papers. Uh, so, you know, lower possible rates for, for that mail. Uh, multiple addresses, uh, some of them being, you know, uh, struck out. Um, and it is sent to Mr. Leroy and Papillon, journalist. Um, so it's, even if it's not, you know, indicated on the, on the letter itself, it's sent at general deliveries. There is no real, you know, delivery address. All we have is, um, you know, the destination city. So the mail remains at the post office waiting for Mr. Leroy and Papillon to arrive. Um, and from the addresses that have been, you know, written down, we know it went to Madras, then it went to Saigon, then to Shanghai, then to San Francisco, and then to the city of Mexico. Uh, and I added here a couple of additional cities where the mail, this envelope traveled to because it was, uh, it bears some postmark from the cities. We have here one from my phone. We have, of course, one from Yokohama, and we have one here from Los Angeles. Even so, uh, none of the cities are listed here in that in that list of addresses. Um, I was able to locate uh, a similar item. Uh, this one is in the collection of, uh, I think, uh, Ron Bentley from the, the uh, SICP. Uh, quite the same, uh, you know, Mr. Le Juan Papillo, journalist, same destination, all of the cities match. Uh, the franking is not completely the same, but quite similar. Um, Instead, this one is a wait arrival. So again, for me, you know, the equivalent of a, a general delivery. Um, and I know of a, of a third item that is quite similar that was sold a few years back by, uh, by Luganum Philately that sadly I, I missed. But uh, so we have at least three of those. And so that started me on, you know, what we have done with, with Ed. I did this research a few, few years back uh, and I was, I was looking at, Okay, who are those guys? Uh, Leroy and Papio, uh, what, what about them? And so I found that there were those two journalists. Here are some like, you know, self portrait of him. Well, each one draw a portrait of his, of his buddy. Um, and they were actually, those two guys decided at one, at one point in their life in, in like 1895, I think, that they were going to go and travel the world and have all the people pay for it. You know, they were the, <laughs> the, the precursor of all of those YouTube influencers, you know, <laughs> who, get, who get stuff, you know, for free. But here they hey, why don't? They had no money. They were probably out of a job. They were in Paris. They were at the bar. And they decided that, hey, why don't we go and, and take, you know, take a trip and let's see if we can, if we can make it. And their, their goal was to basically write articles as they were traveling and, and sell a little journal called En Route, uh, which was something that was uh, the journal of two Parisian reporters, um, you know, redaction and administration in the world. Uh, this is the first the, the the head you know the header of the first you know issue of, of this uh, this uh, newspaper that at the time was I think just two or four page yeah two or four pages max um, and was was issued in uh, in Nice 
in, in February of 1895. Um, I have found a few extracts of, of, you know, like comments in the press or, or articles in the press, some in the Japan uh, Weekly Mail, some in the San Francisco Call um, in 96 and 97, where here, for example, we have on the 1st of September, the journalistic globetrotters, Mr. Loa and Papillo, left Shanghai for Pekin, for Beijing, uh, where they intend to issue in Chinese and English another number of en route. The North China Herald opinions that this is a bold undertaking, as it supposes it will be the first foreign paper ever published at the capital of the Middle Kingdom. Um, and here goes another similarity with you know, the operation of, of, of Professor Segno that Ed you know, talked about earlier, where those guys actually, as they were traveling and they were publishing their, their little journal and selling it uh, in order to afford their, their stay or their journey, uh, they would publish locally in French and the local language. Uh, some articles in English, but here in the case of the one in, in, uh, in China, they were published basically Chinese and English. I think there were some articles in French because somewhere I read that they had a a trilingual, and it was the first trilingual newspaper in uh, in China. Um, the next little extract here says that, you know, Mr. Lo and Papillo, the two French journalists whose arrival we chronicled last week, have overcome the initial difficulties connected with an edition of En Route in Japan. They will bring out a Japan edition in a few weeks with illustration by Ogawa, the famous Tokyo photographer. Um, I'm, I haven't found any any issue of, of that Japanese newspaper, or, you know, or who's that Japanese issue, I would really love to put my hands on it, but hey, that's part of the, part of the challenge and part of the search. Um, and here you see, you know, with the, the article, uh, little entrefilet from, from the San Francisco call, um, en route, an intermittent publication, which Monsieur, uh, Lessy, a little typo, but Le Roi and Papillo, two Parisian reporters are publishing, is ready to come out in San Francisco. The paper will be on sale Saturday uh, at the news dealers and perhaps uh, by the news boys. Um, there will be 10 pages okay, of text and illustration. So the, the newspaper had grown in size okay, from the initial, like, you know, two page, to four page to 10 pages, uh, have the space in French and have the space in English. Uh, the scheme of the true travelers was to travel around the world, publishing in every country and in the native language of that country, an issue of their paper. The subscription includes a copy of each issue and there have been 13 issues so far. Um, I think at the time they, they were in, um, in Asia, they had something like 3000 subscribers to their newspaper, uh, which, which brought them quite, quite a lot of money. And they were, they were becoming quite famous because a lot of local local journals were talking about their, about their journey, about their, their trip. Um, so let's go, let's go back to this there. Well, we have a little bit of a better idea about those two, those two characters. So um, that letter was initially mailed in, in Mumbai. Okay. That's, they were actually probably having some, uh, they attended some event or, or were hosted by the French Patent Medicines Association in, in Bombay. Um, so there was no, no question that this is where the letter originates. We have a somewhat, you know, legible council with 23, uh, January 23rd, India postage stamp, uh, Afana, two, uh, two Pondicherry, all that remains in the, in the country. Uh, most likely that letter traveled with uh, the kind of the, the British Crown Mail Service, if you want, you know, in the colony at, then, at that time, arriving in Pondicherry on the 25th, so just two days. Um, and it was forwarded probably, what, um, barely a week later uh, from Pondicherry, this time with the French packets to, uh, to Saigon, to Indochina. Uh, and I think that's that's why uh, Ron Bentley has has one of those in his collection as well. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure when it arrived because it's it's not always easy to to figure out the exact route from from Pondicherry to to um, uh, Colombo in in Sri Lanka and then from uh, from there on the on the line and uh, packets to to Saigon. Um, but in the literature, I found that they were effectively in, in Saigon attending some meetings with the Society of, of Indo-Chinese Studies from Saigon, 
uh, in, in late February 1896. Um, in passing, I mean, this is pretty much a year after they had left and published their first issue in Nice in February of 1895, okay? So it took them a year to go from, from Southern France <laughs> to, uh, to Indochina. Uh, so it is likely that in Saigon, they went to the post office, got their mail and uh, took it with them to, to Haiphong because there is no postmark on this letter from, from Saigon whatsoever. So going to, from Haiphong, um, they mailed on July 28th, this is the, the dead stamp that we have here, not really easy to, to read, but um, they put a second five, stamp, five centim stamp from Indochina this time, you know, we had one from India, no, it was, was one from Indochina, and they decided to forward that mail from, uh, from Haiphong to Shanghai. Uh, so the mail travel uh, by the, the maritime service and it had a stopover in Hong Kong uh, on August 1st. Um, while the mail was going to, to Shanghai, uh, according to the, the stories of Leroy and Papillo, they were visiting the Along Bay, they went to the island of Hainan, they went to Hong Kong, they went a little bit everywhere. Um, they were really enjoying their, their trip, we can, we can say that. Um, from, from Shanghai, there is no, no Chinese stamps, so I once again here, I'm, I'm kind of you know, making the hypothesis that they took their mail with them uh, as they traveled from, from China to Japan. I know that when they were in China, they traveled from Shanghai to Beijing and then come back and finally left for, uh, for the island of Japan. So uh, most likely they had their mail in their, in their luggage and once in, in, uh, in Yokohama, uh, they decided to send that mail. Maybe they had decided where to go next or so they decided to send that mail from Yokohama to San Francisco. Um, the, the Japanese cancel was a little bit of a challenge. Uh, so I don't speak Japanese. So of course that's, <laughs> that's always more difficult, but I, I was lucky that I had a, one of my colleagues here in Portland who, who was Japanese. So, uh, we looked at those scans and, and the cover. Uh, and so when, when you flip one of the, one of the, the images here to get the cancel pretty much in, on its normal shape and you combine it or you look at it. Uh, you contrast it with the cancel on the postcard, you can kind of make up for, for everything that's on it. And so this is the text of that, of that cancel. Um, and my, my Japanese friend was a little bit, oh. And then he told me, oh, he had a little of a haha moment where he said, yeah, no, it's true that back then uh, we wrote the Japanese script from right to left. So, <laughs> we decided to flip all of those characters and then which gave us those different, different thing. And we say, okay, oh, those that's the Musashi prefecture, the city of Yokohama, that is the first month of the 30 year of the Meiji era. And this is the 26th day. And this is the second collection. So we know exactly when that letter was mailed uh, from Yokohama on January 26, 1897. Um, and all of those dates, all of those cancels match basically all of the postmark match what I was able to learn about the trip of those two gentlemen. Uh, they were effectively in Yokohama uh, in early November, uh, and they spent a few months in Japan, uh, and they only embarked late January, so they probably mailed that letter a few days or maybe even on the day of their departure to, to San Francisco, except that they didn't go straight to San Francisco. They decided to spend a few weeks in, in Hawaii, you know, having a little bit of a vacation. <laughs> that, would be, that would be my guess. And once in, um, in San Francisco, so on the, on the letter, we have a name not in directory with, I think, a number five. And the postcard, it's hard to read, but there is a general delivery, February 15, 1897 uh, a.m., I'm going to assume both of them were put as that those items arrived uh, in San Francisco. Um, here again, they got their mail, uh, they published a newspaper, and then they traveled south to Los Angeles, uh, and they decided to mail probably for one last time, you know, their, their what was no philatelic souvenir, and, and sent it from uh, from Los Angeles, uh, yeah, to Mexico City, which is why we have then that that U.S. stamp here uh, with the Los Angeles postmark. Um, and then after that, there is not much about them. 
Um, apparently, uh, one of the two decided to remain in Mexico. Maybe he was tired of <laughs> of being a drifter. Uh, and so he, he got a real job uh, and started working as the editor of a French newspaper in, in Mexico City, L'Eco Francais. Uh, and what I found was that Lucien Leroy, after a year, uh, moved to New Orleans and uh, he was said to have published a final issue of the En Route newspaper that was dedicated or focused on La Nouvelle Orléans and its French colony uh, or its French community, I think would be a better, a better term. Um, so altogether, uh, this is pretty much the, the trip from those two guys. Okay, so they left Paris in January 1895. They went to Nice, where they published the first issue of their, of their newspaper in February 1895. Then they moved to Milan, then to Rome, then they went to Athens. From there, they went to Istanbul. Istanbul, they went to Alexandria, but they stopped over in quite a few places. They went to Jerusalem, they went to, I think, Cyprus, they went to Aleppo and whatnot, uh, made it to Alexandria, then to Cairo. Uh, the story said that they had some fantastic dinners on boats on the Nile River or at the feet of the pyramids, you know, to entertain the local, I don't know, local <laughs> government officials and, 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 or French people, I have no idea, but, but th th there were some, some chronicles about the, the fast of their, of their lifestyle. Uh, then from there, they traveled to India. And so that's the first, basically, you know, postmark that we have for the, for the card. So that when, when they realized, oh, we should start sending us postcards. That would make nice souvenirs. You know, it's too bad they didn't do it from, from day one, but they were already a year in their trip. And here from, from Bombay, then they sent their postcard to, to Pondicherry. Um, and then they went uh, Saigon. Uh, they went to Phnom Penh. I know they were, they were received by uh, King uh, Norodom in, in, in Phnom Penh, uh, though they had a, a nice meeting there. I don't know which of those two issues was published first. Uh, then I found Shanghai, they went to Beijing, then Yokohama, and then they took the boat, stopped somewhere in the in the ocean in, in Hawaii, and then they made it to San Francisco, Los Angeles, and then Mexico City. Uh, quite a nice trip. And if effectively they were able to travel for three years, living all their craft and trade at the expense of their, their readers and the people, you know, all of the hotels and restaurants and other, other stores in each of those places that were putting an ad in their newspaper. I think that's, that's pretty neat. Um, I know one of my, one of my friends from Cold France said, yes, yeah, these guys, we are just two, two drifters, two parasites. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if, I, if, if that makes their mail fraud mail, you know, to go in, in Ed's collection, but definitely, definitely two interesting characters. Um, but there is also, and that's the second uh, second cover, or second item I want to go to go over with you. Uh, but before I move there, I will once again mention the fact that um, they were also quite, you know, maybe not multilingual, but they did publish in multiple multiple languages, which also makes for you know, if you want to reach a huge audience, <laughs> in the same case as, as Professor Signal with his with his mail order fraud and his success was, you better you know master quite a few languages to reach the audience in a language they will understand, and so they can effectively buy your buy your products. Um, so let's move to the the next next and final item in this in this review, which this one is a is a mixed franking on on mail from Frankfurt from Germany to Syria, Switzerland. Uh, and we're gonna see as a, as a 40,000 miles journey, that took 200 days. <laughs> so, and this is the cover, or this is the, the postcard, okay, once again. Um, and you can see it's a little bit dirty. It's also quite, quite hard to read. So there is no, no wonder that, that the, you know, the UPU decided that in, in 1925 that, okay, this kind of mail has to stop because this is really, uh, how do you know where to send it and then what's valid on this, on this postcard after, after, you know, two or three of those, of those stops, uh, it's, it's impossible. Um, but it was still an interesting challenge. Okay. And there is no, no reason why one wouldn't, wouldn't try. Um, I bought it 
years back uh, wasn't very expensive. I don't know. Uh, it, it was presented as a, a postcard that had gone around the world. Uh, we see that's not exactly not exactly true. And the only reason I bought it was because of those two five, you know, that pair of five cent, you know, five cent Madagascar uh, group tax stamps on it. Um, you one might say that oh, actually, there is quite a lot of of allegoric figures on all of those stamps. Maybe there was a time, the period in philately where a lot of a uh, lot of stamps were allegoric in nature. Um, you know, a few few French one, uh, one from Argentina, one from from Germany, from the Reich uh, post. But what's also interesting is, so um, we have. I don't know if any one of you has, has started to count them, but I think there is something like eighteen or nineteen different postmark on this on this postcard. Uh, not everything is very 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 easy to read, uh, but we start here with a with a postmark from from Frankfurt. Uh, I think on May f- May the 10th uh, in 1901. Then we have we have postmark from Paris. Uh, so there's one arrival from no, that's a Paris départ. There is a Paris étranger here. There's an arrival in Paris. There's a departure from Paris. Another departure from Paris here. Uh, we have of course uh, a postmark from Majunga in Madagascar. Uh, there is a Singapore to Hong Kong that is, uh, where is it? Uh, this one, um, this one. Uh, I don't recall what it is. But, but there is a Singapore to Hong Kong postmark somewhere. There is a few base office cancels. You have one here, another one here. Uh, oh, here's Singapore to Hong Kong at the bottom here. There is a, a, a China uh, to China Z cancel with the Postal Armée here. You have, uh, of course, the Alger cancels in Algeria, uh, Alger Bourse here, uh, and Alger, Alger here as well. There is some Buenos Aires cancel that you can see. Uh, that is a Buenos Aires number 14. There is another Buenos Aires here at the top. Uh, Buenos Aires here as well. There is a like maritime postmark here. So there is really, really a lot of a lot of cancel on this. Uh, there is an add and transit here. Uh, so a lot of a uh, lot of different things on this on this postcard. Um, the 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 verso or the recto and uh, is also quite quite interesting because oh, you have a a picture of the of the uh, opera house of, from uh, Frankfurt, but the, the text basically read to the kind person that have already been notified by Mr. Chabot and Berger uh, to please forward from one address to the next, as indicated. You know, we thank you. You know, with anticipation and and cordial salutation uh, from Mr. Langer to Mr. Berger. Uh, there is a date Frankfurt on on the 10th of May. Please forward every time, you know, and then strike the, the prior address of the previous address. And then all of the addresses are written down here uh, in the same handwriting. So the person, uh, Mr. Paul Langer, that sent his postcard in, you know, May 10, 1901, uh, had really planned this thing quite, quite nicely with all of the addresses of different people, one in Madagascar, one in China, one in Argentina. And then himself in Serrier in Switzerland. Uh, when I say he had really planned his thing quite well, um, he had actually written on the back. All of this was pre-written by, you know, handwritten by by Paul Langer. So it was relatively easy for each of the recipients to know what to do. There's no, no. No. Uh, all that to do was hey strike this address write the next one it is written on the on the other side put a stamp and send it okay um here i had used at the time um retro reveal which no longer available but there is a replacement from from another another person that helped me a little bit read some of the addresses or read some of the some of the postmark so definitely a quite quite useful tool uh, that i i can strongly you know uh, recommend and you can see quite quickly that you know the handwriting is the same always for the the top part of the address it's the same you know second address third address 
here we don't see it, but you know, uh, Hector Berger and Fifth Address. So all of those were written by Mr. Langer before sending the postcard, and then everything else, it, it's of course hidden by the stamps that were affixed when when the the, the recipient forwarded the, the postcard. But you can see the handwriting is different in each case. Um, so that was basically the different uh, the different recipient writing the address has requested by by Mr. Langer initially. Um, and that's where things didn't go as well and as planned, despite his best efforts. And I have to really, uh, it's admirable, but the problem here with this postcard is that it went to Alger in Algeria. And it was never meant to go to Alger after going to China. But the Bataillon de Zouave, the, the regiment that Mr. Um, Le Red belonged to, actually, when he received the postcard, his regiment has left China and was back to its normal headquarters in Alger. <laughs> and the military mail being quite efficient, obviously the postcard didn't go to Buenos Aires as it was hoped, but it went back to Alger. And from there, the person, you know, mailed it <laughs> to Buenos Aires. So that's why we have this, this French stamp here with a cancel from Alger Bourse. Uh, and then the letter goes to, to Buenos Aires. Um, that's quite sad because that means that that letter went from Frankfurt here to Paris. From Paris, it went with a red line by boat to Majanga when it was a, a, you know, addressed to Mr. Chabot, who was aboard the, the Aviso, uh, you know, the military ship, you know, Rance. From there, it traveled to China, that's the, the blue line, if you want here. And from China, it should have gone east, you know, eastward towards, well, probably further down south and then cross by, by Cape Horn here, or maybe go to San Francisco, cross the country and then travel on the, uh, on the you know, eastern coast of Brazil to Buenos Aires. So that would have been a full circumnavigation to some extent, or at least you know full toward the moon, full full around the world. But that you know purple line didn't happen. Instead, the card went back from China to Alger, though it probably went to Marseille then to Alger, and then from from there, I don't really know if it traveled from Alger directly to Buenos Aires or if it went back to Marseille and then to Paris and then traveled to or to Bordeaux and then traveled to. Uh, to Buenos Aires, but that's basically the, the leg of that journey. And then from Buenos Aires, it went sent back to Switzerland. Uh, and that is actually 40,000 miles, which is not double, but quite much more than a normal, you know, around the world trip, which would be only 25,000 miles. <laughs> and it took 200 days. Uh, and that is that is a little bit of a shame, but it's a, it's a quite quite an interesting an interesting trip altogether. And the fact that this postcard actually arrived <laughs> and reached each of these uh, of, of its you know addresses or, or, or and made it back to to Serrier, even if the trip was not completed in the way it was initially you know sought, I find this really quite quite amazing. Um, and of of course, uh, when, when we have a, a postcard like this, you, you can dig a, a, in so many different directions. And this postcard could be, you know, an item on so many different topics. Uh, you can do some some research. I, I typically do that, you know, on, on the recipient or the sender. So in that case, you know, I, I, had, I remember I had looked into, uh, what was that, that naval officer, you know, Pierre Chabot? Uh, and huh, the Aviso runs. I mean, what what is that vessel? Where was it? Or so you find some data around its uh, uh, that that vessel being part of the uh, like the the French Navy in in Madagascar for some time. And though there was like part of a there is like two sister ships, the uh, the Durance and the Mert. Uh, so the Durance is probably the the one that you can see here on this stamp. Uh, the Mert is that's that's what this kind of uh, of vessels looked like at the time. So the the Rance, the Mert, the, the um, Durance all look the same. Uh, of course, you can also look at because it was sent to a 
a, a military on the on the first Zouav uh, with the, the China Expeditionary Force or, or Corp in uh, in 1901 so that touches the boxer rebellion a lot of different things then when you look at the councils uh you know obviously the the, the base of this council the the china uh, expeditionary force uh overprint the, the singapore to hong kong council all of those also have some some interesting you know area of research for for a philately so i mean you can you can go in so many different ways that it is it is mind-boggling um but they say I am still looking and I have not found it yet, you know, from the the writer of Esperanto or or somebody else, you know, that one cover or postcard that will have a group type stamp and will have completed a true circumnavigation. Um, maybe one day. And I think in the same way that Ed is looking for more covers from Professor Senior, I mean, I'm looking for more <laughs> crazy, ridiculously hard to find items on the on the group type but that's that works what makes the the hobby so so interesting in my opinion so that would be it for me questions if if any yeah i i have I, i'm not sure if it's a question a comment or a thought uh you 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 use the the uh 25,000 mile uh, uh, distance as a, a true journey around the world. But could you could you actually do a journey in 25,000 miles? Oh, the, oh, the circumference, yeah. Yeah, I, I know, but but you have to have play. Well, today, presumably, you do it by airplane. So you, yeah. you'd have to have uh, uh, places to land along the equator. Yeah, true, uh, true. Yeah, I mean, and, I don't know. I, I know seem, inevitably that the the trip would take more than twenty five thousand miles. Yeah, you you could also do a trip that it would be much less if you were just travel at the you know the the, the four yeah. degrees. Below. But you uh, want to do the full twenty five, but it's going to be more. Uh, yeah, well, typically, I think they would have gone, They would have crossed. They would all have crossed the equator quite a few times. So, I mean, most likely the trip will be much longer. You know, in in, in mileage. Um, yeah, but it's just the fact that that, that poor postcard traveled 40,000 miles in 200 days <laughs> and it arrived and it arrived. You know, I mean, uh, you know that, I mean, today, I mean, I have mail traveling from France, even registered that doesn't make it to Portland, which is a shame. <laughs> um, and back then, back what, 120, 120 years ago, the mail did arrive. Um, so that is, that is amazing. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, Anybody else have a comment or question? Uh, just a quick comment on the addressee in the military occupation of China. I'm just wondering if if that was related to the French forces that were sent to deal with the Boxer Rebellion. I, I believe so. Yeah. So yeah. from that point of view, is it's quite an interesting destination for for a very very limited period of time. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there is that that uh, Trésor et Postes aux Armées uh, Council on the postcard from from Ch Xin, I think Z or or two. It's hard to say. I need to do more research on that as well. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you can go there is, <laughs> with with like eighteen or nineteen councils, you know, postmark on this on this on this postcard. There is so much to research. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So different, so different ways to take it. Yeah. Any more? If not, I will offer my thanks to Loic and to Ed for a very interesting program this afternoon and put in a plug for June when I will talk about the sower, the 10 centime red sower stationery that came out of the Jan Kindler collection. Uh, beyond that, we have no formal programs, other uh, no volunteers yet, but we do have a, um, we'll have a show and tell, I think, in November, which will be closer to middle of the month rather than end of the month because of the holiday season. Uh, that went very well last year, so be poking around for something of interest to add to that.